distilled from earth and air, fire and water. Born of alchemy and ancient craft, this amber spirit has an extraordinary history. It's almost an untold story. It's been forgotten about and it's an incredible story. You can't discuss life in Ireland without discussing whiskey. It's that direct link between the land, the barley, and the people that make it. It's about walking in the footsteps of these legends that have gone before me that have left me this wonderful whiskey. Whiskey industry was incredibly important. In Belfast, there was linen, there was shipbuilding. People don't talk about whiskey, but whiskey was enormous. We're actually looking backwards to lost parts of Irish whisky history to create the future. And that's what's really exciting. Irish whisky is now enjoying a 21st century renaissance with the fastest growing spirit sales in the world. Once a world leader whose extraordinary industrial success was almost forgotten, it's a drink with a checkered past. Rogues and rebels, migration and moonshine, taxes and temperance. They're all part of a fascinating whiskey story shared between Ireland, Scotland and America. I'm Mark Thompson, cultural magpie and graphic designer with an enduring interest in branding and advertising. But I'm fascinated too by just how much of this whiskey story connects with my particular obsession, uncovering the heritage of my Ian folk the Ulster Scots. I'm Fanon O'Connor, historian and writer, and for the past 12 years, uncovering and understanding the roots of the Irish whiskey story has become something of an obsession. I've been piecing together a broken history, rediscovering forgotten recipes, and together with other whiskey enthusiasts, trying to recreate some of the great whiskies of the past. Now we have a chance to combine both our passions as we explore the roots of a spirit shared and an enduring rivalry with our nearest neighbour across the narrow sea. And we'll return to an almost forgotten golden age and explore the rise, the fall and perhaps the rebirth of what was once the most famous whisky industry in the world. You're the devil, you're leading me astray Over hills and mountains and to America You're sweeter, stronger, decenter You're spunkier than Tay Oh, whiskey, you're my darling, drunk or sober The connection between agriculture and alcohol is an ancient one. Farmers fermented excess crops like grapes or grain, and it's likely that Irish monks and medics brought the rudiments of distilling back from Mediterranean Europe in the 13th century. Here in the shadow of the Mourns, overlooking Carlingford Loch, is Cologne, probably the smallest distillery in Ireland. Brendan Carty is keeping the oldest whisky traditions alive. There is no longer a still in Kilfagan that's illicit, but there was once, just up the lane beside us here, in Dan White's cottages. My mother always tells me fond memories of, of uh, stills up in Kilku as well, which is another part of South Down, the other side of the Mourns. And um, there's a few still men around today, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I originally trained as an architect and I just got my chartership and the recession happened. So I moved away like most young Irish people did at the time, went to Australia. I was in a whiskey club and I tasted this two-year-old whiskey that in my opinion was better than a 24-year-old pot still from Ireland. And I was like, how is this so good? And I mean it, it was that good. And I went down to Belgrove Distillery in Tasmania and I met Peter Bignall and he explained the process of making whiskey from a farm distillery. He uh, used things grown on that farm. He um, he's smoking his own his own uh, barley as well with sheep shit. <laughs> I 
I wanted to make the whiskey that I wanted to drink. It wasn't in existence anymore anyway, unless you're one of the lucky few who can afford a few thousand pounds to buy some proper pots de Irish whiskey that doesn't really exist anymore. To get an understanding of it, you have to see it brought down to the kind of volcanic level. And this is the essence of how it all works. Like the farmers of old who turned barley, oats and wheat into a rustic beer, the first stage of the whiskey process here starts with malted grains and water, heated together to make what looks suspiciously like porridge. And we're about to get a taste of what comes next. We're taking it back to the start here. So what they've made for us is proto whiskey. So before it becomes whiskey, it's ale. And before it's ale, it's wort, which is farmyard sludge, essentially. Now, wort does not sound very appetizing, and, you know, it looks like shock water. Well, give it a taste and tell me what you think, because it's not appetizing to many people, but whiskey's delicious, so it makes up for it in the end. Well, it's sweet. Yeah, it's sugar. It's really sweet and kind of earthy at the same time. All alcohol comes from sugar, whether it's wine or cider or whiskey. And when we malt, we're just getting seeds to open up as if they're going to grow, and they showcase their sugars, and that's what we use. In a sense, all whiskey begins life as beer, and the process of transforming it into hard alcohol hasn't actually changed much in the thousand years since Arabic innovators refined the distillation process. The heated ale turns into vapor and passes through a coiled copper pipe called a worm cooling back as clear spirit. For hundreds of years, this was how it was drunk. White, often straight from the still. Ishkabaha, the water of life. Over time, this Gaelic word, Ishka, would morph into whiskey. We like to say in Ireland that we invented whiskey. In truth, whiskey isn't invented, it evolves. I mean, over 800 years, what we call whiskey, it leaks out the back door of the church into the nearest copper kettle. It travels from the wakes of tenant farmers to the drawing rooms of politicians. And of course, it crossed the Atlantic with the Ulster Scots and 200 years later came back home with an American accent. It becomes a global drink. It becomes a global spirit. Built on a proud heritage, three famous names came to represent Irish whiskey to the world during the 20th century. Powers, Jameson, and Old Bush Mills. Any good Ulster whiskey fan knows the date 1608, the world's oldest licensed distillery. But the truth is more complex. In 1608, commercial distilleries didn't exist, and the man who was granted the license wasn't a distiller, and he didn't live in Bush Mills. Thomas Phillips was the king's man in Limavady, a town he had helped build, and he was licensed to nominate respectable distillers and to collect their taxes on behalf of the crown. Rural and homespun, there was plenty of whiskey, and by the time Bush Mills was built in 1784, there were five different distillers on this townland alone. In truth, the old Bush Mills distillery was the child rather than the parent of the rich malt heritage of the North Ulster coast. A heritage entrusted these days to the careful hand and expert nose of Bush Mills master blender and the first woman to be inducted into the Whiskey Hall of Fame, Helen Mulholland. There has been generations of work going into perfecting these whiskies. If you could take this whisky back, because I mean, this has been here for what, 25 years? That's a good chunk of your career. My background is a science background. Um, and distillation is a science. I was brought up that, that things are, are black and white in the science world. You, you put um, distillate into two casks, which are exactly the same casks. You should get the same thing out of it, but you don't. Once you come into maturation, it changes to an art, and that's the wonder and joy. 
do work with living, breathing casks in a completely natural environment. And what you get from each cask, you combine those flavours to create one whisky. I'm incredibly lucky in that I get to blend the whiskies. So a traditionally made whisky embodies a spirit of place and a deep connection to the human hands that made it. But whisky has always been about evolution and exchange too. The stretch of water that flows between Ulster and Scotland is a very narrow sea. Since ancient times, people, language, beliefs and ideas have crossed in both directions. And whisky too has been part of that sharing between neighbours, kith and kin. We're heading north from Bally Castle in search of a story that shows how connected our different whisky traditions really are and just how significant a role Ulster has played. To be in the middle of it, it's just real. You know, it's not an idea anymore. It's not a, an abstract concept. There's Kintyre, there's Rathlin. We've left Antrim. And anybody from any of those places with the right boat and the right conditions, you can easily get across. From a whiskey perspective, this triangle, you have Kintyre, Campbellton, you have Isla, you have Inishowen, Donegal, right along the North Ulster coast. The shared blur between the two homelands of whiskey. People carry traditions, liquid traditions, as well as oral traditions. It's an incredible thing just to be in the middle of this new physical map. It's a whole new way of just imagining this part of the world. For close on a thousand years, a Gaelic maritime kingdom existed between Antrim and the Western Isles, Dalriada. Over time, the MacDonald dynasty became the lords of the Isles, their strongholds dominating both shores. An hour after leaving Antrim, we've arrived in Isla, famed for its whiskey the world over. The ruins of a MacDonald fortress still standing guard over Lagavulin Bay. We sail into this world famous bay with world famous names that have been here for centuries. We go past the MacDonald Castle. And when you realise that and the penny drops, this is one landscape, it's one seascape. So is this narrow sea that we have crossed today the birthplace of whiskey? The records of traffic of whiskey between Ulster. Isla, the Hebrides in general, the Mullet Kintyre, those records are older than our earliest records of the word whiskey. You know, it's, it's Ushkava, it's Ishkabaha, it's changing shape through the centuries, right up to 19th century Pochin. It continues to ebb back and forth, long before we get notions of Irish whiskey or Scotch whiskey, long before branding. Sadly, we haven't time for a dram of Lagavulin. We're following in the footsteps of an Ulsterman, brought to Isla as part of a bride's dowry when Anya Nikon wed Angus MacDonald in 1302. His name was Macbaha, or in English, Beaton, a scholar and a physician, whose family would in time become doctors to the kings of Scotland. But here on Isla, the Beaton family is remembered for a different reason, their knowledge of distilling. And this cross honors the family's gift to this island and to Scotland too. A lot of people still trace Scotch whiskey history back here to Kilholman. Ushkava distilled by the, the Macvah, the, the Beatons of the Lord of the Isles. It would be hard to underestimate the importance of the family's arrival here. The Beatons Cross overlooks the distillery at Kilholman, one of nine on the island, producing some of the most famous brands in the world. The making of Isla's distinctive peated whisky has been a huge part of island life for centuries. And Scotland's legendary distiller, Jim McEwen, is in no doubt about how their whisky story began. 
It's unique to have so many distilleries in this one island. They've been around for a long, long time, and going right back to war, 1779. So we know of no other type of community. This is the way it's always been. It's always been a community-based island, and that was built upon the foundation of whiskey. If you look at the geography of Isla, very close to Scotland and also quite close to Ireland as well. I mean, you can see Ireland every day. And there's no doubt that's where the whisky came from. The art of distillation came into Scotland via Ireland. You were doing it before we were. Uh, some people would challenge that, but the records certainly show that. The Bedens who shared their distilling knowledge with this island community couldn't have known how important whisky would become here. Well, I'm sure that by now their ghosts have grown fond of Isle of Malt, but as a fellow Ulsterman, I can think of no better tribute than to pour them a taste of the Schmel's cast strength spread. A wee taste of home. Four hundred or so years after the first beaten went to Isla, whiskey was still very much part of everyday life in rural Ireland. A way to use surplus grain, a social drop, a curative, something to trade with the neighbours, a valuable commodity. By the 18th century, the demand was so great that a Scottish entrepreneur saw his Irish opportunity. This is Middleton, County Cork, home to some of the great names of Irish distilling. Nearly 250 years of whisky history is held here, including the archive of the Scotsman who gave his name to one of Ireland's great whiskies, John Jameson. The history of Jameson Irish whisky goes back to 1780 when our founder, John Jameson, who was an enterprising individual, he'd be an entrepreneur if he was around today, and he took a chance. He left his homeland in Scotland and he came to Dublin. Now, Dublin in the 1780s was a hotspot. It was somewhere you wanted to be. If you were a young, ambitious individual, this was a place that was going to give you opportunity. And he saw opportunity in making Irish whiskey. A lot of people often ask me, well, what persuaded John Jameson to come to Dublin back in 1780? What would have attracted him here? And I think the answer is in this little book. This is an excise receipt book from the 1790s for one of the distilleries in Cork City. And basically, it's setting out what they pay per month in excise tax to the revenue man. So we have here the 24th of March, 1797. And in that one month, this one distillery in Cork is paying 932 pounds sterling in tax. If they're paying that in tax, can you imagine what they're making in profit? Our heritage is what defines us. It's what made us. I have hundreds of years of distilling records, literally ledgers written by all the distillers who made Jameson whiskey. And it's a wonderful sense of continuity that what people were doing 100 or 200 years ago, we're basically doing the same thing today. John Jameson sought his fortune in Dublin at the end of the 18th century, a century which had been less kind to many. Since 1717, more than a quarter of a million Ulster Scots had emigrated in hopes of a new life and greater freedom in America. Some brought their love of a dram, and the skill to make it. In western Pennsylvania, they borrowed rye from their German neighbors and began a new American chapter in whiskey's unfolding story. Whiskey was part of the American experience. It's intractable from the United States itself. 
After the War of Independence uh, on the Western Frontier in Pennsylvania, rye whiskey had become a type of commodity. So what made whiskey so important to the economy was that unlike grain that might go off, or indeed beer that might go off and spoil, whiskey would be, and it, it made whiskey a currency that you could trade on the frontier for other goods. A new federal whiskey tax caused such fury that in 1794, many took up arms against the very government they had helped establish. James McFarland came from County Tyrone, Dungannon. When he came over, he fought in the Revolutionary War. When the federal taxes imposed on whiskey, McFarland decided then to take up arms against the American government. They had fought against taxation without representation, and what they felt the tax was imposing on them was somehow belied the principles of the American Revolution. Riots break out in Philadelphia. And of course, Philadelphia at that time was the nation's capital. So Pennsylvania was a real hotspot for the Whiskey Rebellion. He raises a troop of 600 men at one stage and gathers in uh, Mingo Creek near the Presbyterian Church there. And he goes after tax collectors and uh, excise officers. Eventually, it requires George Washington, the president at the time, but of course a former general, to raise the federal army and march westwards. It's only with Washington's march through Pennsylvania that the rebellion is effectively quelled. I don't think there's any other case in American history where a president has led an army on American soil, not even during the Civil War. But there is still lingering discontent amongst many farmers and whiskey distillers in America for some time to come. Like their ancestors who left Ulster to escape taxation and federal control, the Scotch-Irish who moved south and west from Pennsylvania found new ways to make their mash. Rye and New World corn mixed to create a new whiskey that took its name from the bluegrass state, Kentucky Bourbon. Tastes of our whiskey drinking cousins would in time have a huge impact on the industry on this side of the Atlantic. But when taxing American whiskey caused such a stir, the same thing was also happening here at home. Whiskey and taxes have always had a turbulent relationship. By the late 18th century, stricter laws and higher taxes had driven most licensed distillers out of business or underground. But this didn't stop the flow. Ireland now had two drinks, legal parliament whiskey and illegal potching. There are literally thousands of stills impounded every year. If we draw a line from, say, Clare up to Antrim, if you look northwest of that line, you're in another league, you're in the Premier League for potching. <laughs> And Donegal was the epicentre of this. I've even heard stories of Presbyterian ministers in Donegal who were um, liberated from their charge, shall we say, because they were found to have had stills. You know, it's not moonshining at this point. There's entire communities involved. The village of Urris actually barricaded themselves for three years to protect what had become an all-village com you know, community endeavour. You have the farmers involved, you have smugglers involved, you have the women involved, you have... The local landlord, who's probably the local judge, is turning a blind eye. He's taking his cut. And there starts to be this regional taste that emerges. You see this preference for old Inish Owen. And it seems to have been, not unlike Isla, peated, malt, new make. But also, Inish Owen, as a phrase, gets used just to refer to peated malt in general. Usually illicit, but sometimes legitimate. But today, Irish whiskey doesn't seem to have that very smoky, kind of peated flavour. It's a lost drink. It's a lost flavour within the story of Irish whiskey. The hunt for that lost spirit of the past has inspired a new generation. This is when you have to make the hard decision. As to like what me, gets Brendan what Carty is seen. fascinated by the traditions the and tastes of former days. As many distillers did before him, he's using his nose to mark the precise point in the process to make his cut. 
It's certainly different. The selected spirit that will then be placed in wooden casks to become Killowan whiskey. From beginning until the end of the distillation, um, there's a huge change in how, how things smell. In the beginning, you're getting pear drops, you're getting uh, like acetone sort of notes, and then at your hearts, you start to get these biscuity notes and spicy notes that, that, and vanilla notes that we are after here. And then towards the end, you start to get smelly feet and <laughs> dirty socks type of notes, and that's old not boots. exactly an old boots. And those aren't the characteristics you want in your whiskey, at least not in large quantities anyway. So distillers for centuries have been using their nose to decide when to make the cut. I had expected it to be more of a shock, sharper, but it's very, very pleasant. You're right, the, and that comes down to the amount of copper that we have in our distillation as well. We run our stills for 12 hours. It's a much slower distillation. For me, it's all about historical continuity. It's all about old recipes, old pots de Irish whiskey is what we're really in love with in Cologne. The grains that you select, Brandon, are they from this general local area? The oats are grown just down the lane. So we're in this highland maritime environment here. So we've got the winds coming off the Irish Sea and they're carrying with it this salty air. And then we've got rye and wheat in there too, which used to play a very important part in Irish distillation history. This is a product of agriculture. The three ingredients that you need to make whiskey are water, grains, and yeast. It is the land, it's part of the land. 200 years ago, a rural, intensely local whiskey like Brendan's would probably have attracted the unwelcome attention of the gouger, the government-appointed excise man. And in Donegal in particular, it was dangerous work. The head of the excise describes armed escorts bringing to the Londonderry market, he says they ride like cavalry. They escort the product in, nobody will touch them. They make sure it's sold. They escort it right back out. It's brazen. Who is the key excise man in the middle of this? A rather unfortunate fellow, Aeneas Coffey. He gets ambushed in a glen, nearly run through the ribs. And he's not remembered for the excise. He's remembered for when he leaves the excise. He leaves in 1824, he disappears for six years, and then he drops some designs off to the patent office. At this same point, you see essentially a tech race to crack bulk distillation, continuous distillation. And there's a few designs before coffees, but his is the first that really works. And those blueprints become critical to how distilling works today. Coffee is thought of as the father of industrial distilling. Aeneas Coffee's blueprints revolutionized alcohol production. His device, known as the coffee or column still, changed whiskey forever. Two centuries later, his groundbreaking system is still in use, and I've come to the Great Northern Distillery in County Louth to see it in action. This is our still hall. This is where we have all the distillation apparatus. We have the pots, we have the gin still, and we have the columns. It's astonishing. This already looks enormous. What's the full extent now, of the column? there's another three floors up above and one down below us. It is a phenomenal piece of engineering. It follows Mr. Coffey's original design. There were other continuous distillation processes around the world before that, but Mr. Coffey's was the innovation that took a big step forward. Its consistency, quality, volume and energy efficiency. If I was running 24-7, I would look for 24 million litres of pure alcohol from these columns each year. Pot steels, by their nature, will give you a variability from batch to batch. I want the batch that's made today to match the one that's made in midwinter exactly. I don't want any variability because my customers expect the batch coming next year to be the same as the batch that I'm making today. As with any disruptive technology, not everyone embraced the coffee still. Traditionalists derided the alcohol it produced as tasteless spirit. But it wasn't long before some producers discovered that it could be mixed with small quantities of Highland malt or an Irish pot still to make a lighter and significantly cheaper tipple, a new blended whiskey. 
There is a fundamental difference in taste between pot still whisky and whisky produced by the coffee still. And the Irish pot still distillers believed that pot still whisky tasted better. And they were very proud of this and very protective of it. They never had an issue as such with the coffee still. Their issue was when somebody distilled whisky with a column still and called it pot still. At the time, our Irish whisky was all pot still. There was nothing else. The big Irish companies, mainly the Dublin distillers, totally rejected it. The Scots, particularly the lowland ones, decided they would adapt a new technology because at the time in the mid 19th century, people were generating a lot more income. There were people working in the city, so they had disposable income and they wanted to drink. So the Scots catered to that. They made a, a product that was drinkable, it was consistent, and it was cheaper. The column still was incredibly disruptive to the whole drinks industry, not only whiskey. What it did to the Irish distillers was it put them on the back foot because that was a technology they didn't largely embrace. There were some column stills, mostly in, in the north. The only ones in Ireland that did it were the Irish industry moved from the Liberties in Dublin very quickly to the north of Ireland and they set up column stills mainly in Belfast. From the early 19th century, Belfast was well on its way to becoming an industrial powerhouse. It began with linen and mills like this one, then shipbuilding and whiskey too spread Belfast's name around the globe. The sheer size of the industry uh, right across the island. But look in Belfast, people don't talk about whiskey, but whiskey was uh, enormous. And back then, I mean, you're talking about huge employers. In the Belfast Commercial Chronicle of 1808, Messrs Napier and Dunville respectfully informed the world of their intention to set up their wine and spirit grocers. Making pot still whiskey at first. Unlike Dublin, they embraced the new technology of the column still and soon began blending in-house. Dunville's, as they became known, grew with the industrial city to build a whiskey empire. Such was their success, they even had their own railway network, transporting raw materials and finished whiskey to and from Belfast Harbour, from where their product was sent around the world. The names of local streets and even a park and a football team, Distillery FC, were a testament to the company's impact on this city. When Messrs Dunville and Napier set up shop at the start of the 19th century, they and other spirits grocers like them didn't just change how whiskey was marketed, they helped change its very identity. Distillers and spirit merchants discovered that leaving their whiskey in sherry casks did strange and wonderful things to the colour and flavour. That liquid goes in clear and a few years later it's going to come out brown. So that's what the magic of casking is about. And it's not just about changing colour, it's also about getting flavour from the cask. A cask is a living thing, a cask breathes, a cask gets old. The casks spend a lot more time doing their job than we do. We spend a week or two making the spirit, whereas the casks spend about three years minimum. When I say they're living, breathing things, that's because the spirit basically moves in and out of the wood as the seasons change. So whenever it gets hot, the spirit moves into the wood. When it gets cold, the wood contracts and the spirit moves back into the cask. And when it's moving in, it's pulling with it those tannins. And the wood is basically given every ounce of itself back into the spirit, especially where cologne's concerned. You know, we've got sherry casks, we've got American bourbon casks, Jamaican dark rum casks, Mexican tequila casks, PX sherry casks. A cask here, which is a chocolina cask from the Basque country with acacia heads. So we're getting really geeky there. On my right hand side here, I've got a lovely port cask and you do think at night, you know, what would pair well? So it's holding a 12-year-old whiskey at the moment. Port there would give a lovely fruity note. In fact, it ends up tasting like Skittles at the end, which is fantastic. The whole thing is a mixture between art and science. If you were being purely scientific, you would get a bad product. If you're being purely artistic, things aren't going to work. So you have to use your imagination. That's where the art 
and where the casks do their work. That's what actually makes spirit whiskey. The process of casking and maturation was refined and developed as the 19th century unfolded, a century that would become Irish whiskey's golden age. But that might never have happened were it not for a helping hand from Mother Nature. By a twist of fate, an American grape louse hopped the Atlantic and decimated the vineyards of Europe. Deprived of brandy and cognac, the moneyed classes, both at home and abroad, began filling their glasses with whiskey. Irish whiskey became the second biggest drink in the world after rum. And uh, it did so because it was interesting. It was of its time. It was full of flavor. The devastation that was wreaked by that hideous little louse that wiped out a lot of the vineyards in Europe. Not just wine was in short supply, but things like brandy. And this opened the doors for Irish whiskey because it was seen as a prestige drink. The empire's favorite dram became traditional Irish pot still. And at the height of the boom, over 60% of the whiskey consumed globally was made in Ireland. For me, what made Irish whiskey and continues to make Irish whiskey so special, it's the people. When I look back at the archive, that's what stands out for me. The greatest discovery going through the records was how truly global Irish whiskey was. I've records from South America, from Uruguay, it's been sold over to Russia, it's been sold down to Australia, to New Zealand. Literally, there isn't anywhere that Irish whiskey wasn't being sold. Of all the industries in Ireland, it, it, we, it's the one that we scaled. We made whiskey industrial. And the powerhouses were Dublin and Belfast. Those two engines were responsible for the vast majority of whiskey coming out of Ireland. Established distillers of premium pot still whiskey weren't overly worried by legislation which allowed merchants to buy, blend, and bottle their own whiskey. Maybe they should have been. These merchants and grocers knew the value of a brand. As their customer base increased, they became a new force in the market. One of the things we don't talk about in Ireland is how we inflicted the most deadly wound of all on ourselves, is we didn't brand. It was a commodity. Distillers made whiskey. They didn't sell whiskey. They sold it on to someone else who would build a brand. And those brands were built by bonders, by shopkeepers. They weren't built by a distillery. We had whiskey in barrels sloshing around the place. That isn't a brand. The Scots were branding whiskey way back in the Victorian period with you know, Johnny Walker and, and many, many other brands. There was a bit of branding in Northern Ireland, but particularly down south, very, very little. This was the first whiskey label that sparked my interest. Once made, just up the road in County Down, the Ulster Scots town once famed for the production of old Cumber Pure Pot Still Irish whiskey. Enjoyed by aristocrats and royalty, but known locally as Old Cumber. Through my love of branding and marketing and advertising that I began to look into this whole world. And what I found was that there were entrepreneurial distillers in the north of Ireland, in the province of Ulster, who looked across the water and who saw business opportunity in not just producing Irish whiskey, but in producing and selling Scotch whiskey too. And there's a whole world here that starts to open up when you start to look at how the product was marketed around 100 years ago. So you take, for example, Andrew A. Watt Londonderry, and established 1762, not only are they producing Irish whiskey, with some very, very famous, beautiful coloured labels like this one here, which says Londonderry on the bottom. It also says Glasgow, because they were also trying to capitalise on the wonderful tradition of Inishowen by turning Inishowen into a commercially produced brand. Later on, then, they expanded across the water and started to produce, in Glasgow, Craig Do Old Highland Whiskey. And both of them were being marketed together at the same time. And Watts wasn't the only one that was doing that. As you come on around the coast, Mitchells, for example, two brothers, one in Belfast, one in Glasgow. The Belfast one producing these very famous 
old ceramic flagons of Cruskeen Lawn Irish whiskey. The brother across the water in Glasgow was producing the grey beard Heather Dew Scotch whiskey. And again, the two products were being marketed simultaneously. And this goes on and on and on, and that natural overlap that there is between the province of Ulster, the north of Ireland, and Scotland is literally flowing through all of these wonderful, wonderful old artefacts. And even the biggest of them all, Dunville's and their Royal Irish Distillery in Belfast, they expanded into Scotland. Here is one HMS Scotch Whiskey, Dunville & Co. Limited, Glasgow. Now, of course, Scotch Whiskey doesn't have an E. What people perhaps don't know is that for a long time, Irish whiskey didn't have an E either. There is Dunville's special liqueur with no E. Um, the E was a marketing invention that probably began among some of the bigger distillers in Dublin. Um, there is no hard and fast rule in history. Sometimes there's an E, most of the time there wasn't. <laughs> Port cities profited as Irish whiskey production quadrupled. For the 19th century entrepreneur looking to make a fortune fast, whiskey was the business to be in. As the century progressed, the whiskey business became quite a lucrative market, and then this allowed a lot of families to accumulate wealth and status and rise up the ranks of the middle classes. But as these families integrated further into Ulster society, they became further involved in both local and national politics, which became really important, especially towards the end of the century, um, as the middle classes in Ulster became more politically active. Whiskey made many an Ulster family famous. Mitchells, McConnells, and of course, Dunvilles. In the 1860s, a young man of Ulster Scots descent, James Craig, became a partner. His son, also James, became a company director and a millionaire. Dunvilles' financial success underpinned a political career that would see him become Northern Ireland's first Prime Minister. Away from politics and big business, whiskey was embedded in rural life throughout Ireland. A familiar presence at Wedding, Wake and Cayley, and in the poems and songs of the people. O oh, whiskey, my darling, thou care-killing carlin, how oft I have cast thee for weeks at a time, and I, when I'm drinking, thou easest my thinking, and now I'm come back for to taste thee again. Whiskey is really entwined with, with the culture of the Celtic nations as a whole. It goes into everything we do, and if you go back through history, it's something that I think it's always kind of been with us. The Ordnance Surveyors who mapped and measured Ulster in the 1830s also recorded some interesting observations about life. Time and again in Ulster Scots communities, they noted a marked fondness for whiskey, often to excess. Whiskey was part of rural life that had been for centuries, but the mass production of the spirit in the early 19th century, often led by Scots and Ulster Scots entrepreneurs, had consequences other than industrial success. Belfast was booming, the fastest growing city in Victoria's empire, but her subjects were drowning in a sea of whiskey. As thousands came looking for work, the harshness of life in the industrial city drove many to seek solace in the dram shop. Whiskey was the devil, blamed for the rise in domestic abuse, poverty and prostitution. A temperance movement, which began in Ulster, spread throughout the British Isles, becoming a huge force for social change. This building that we're in today, Townsend Street Presbyterian Church, it's interesting that it's almost halfway between where the massive Royal Irish distilleries were and where the enormous amount of bonded warehouses were down at the side of the docks. This church would have 1,500 people in it on a Sunday evening. It was common in churches uh, to preach against the use of drink because they, they saw very much the evils of drink. The Irish Temperance League was quite strident in attempting to show people that there was a, a, another way of living. 
And it was a response to the serious problems that drink was causing, and particularly whiskey, which was cheap in Belfast, uh, particularly amongst the working classes and working class men. Uh, there was a serious drinking culture. And I've seen a statistic somewhere that said there were 500 dram houses in Belfast. 550, I'm told. And uh, I mean, it was, it was a serious problem, but then you've got to recognize that the, the world of that time, working men working all week in hard conditions, would then perhaps at weekends really drink heavily. And I mean, the stories about wives uh, linking arms across the road to stop their men going into pubs. That was one of the ironies of middle class society at this time is that many of the whiskey distillers would have been in business or other social circles with uh, many advocates of the temperance movement. A lot of these other social concerns and political concerns would have outweighed any disagreement that they would have had over the idea of temperance and morality of making their money from whiskey. Temperance, however, had little impact on production. By the end of the 19th century, Irish distillers were selling their whiskey from America to Argentina. For every case of Scotch whiskey sold, Ireland sold three. It couldn't last. Temperance had come to mean total abstinence in the early years of the 20th century. And as war engulfed the world, a teetotal David Lloyd George, soon to be prime minister, declared drink to be more dangerous than Germany. Crippling taxes and legislation which decreed that whiskey must be stored in oak casks for three years before sale put many blended brands out of business. A year-long ban on distilling to preserve grain for the war effort dealt the whiskey industry another body blow. History hasn't always been kind to Irish whiskey. There's been golden years where things were fantastic, but there have been times that were really, really hard distillery after distillery closed. And for those remaining distillers, it was a scary time. They were worried that if they all closed, there would be nobody left who even knew how to distill Irish whiskey. Post-war recession, a violent struggle for independence and partition hit the industry hard. But many believe the death knell sounded in January 1920 when America introduced prohibition. Tensions that had been simmering for years between Scottish and Irish producers began to boil over. Scotland's whiskey cartels accelerated their aggressive takeover of the market, buying and closing distilleries on both sides of the Irish Sea, shutting down the competition. That's what every company would like to do to its competition if they could. You know, if you've got some good competition, you buy them and close them down, and then you take them out of the game. What led to the demise of Irish whiskey as a, as a global force was, in fact, a perfect storm. There was no one thing. There was many, many things swirling around. Everything to do from the growth of, of blended scotch to prohibition to, you know, independence. Well, lots of reasons. This Belfast Museum is a window through time to a city where the making of whiskey employed thousands and generated millions. These relics are reminders of some of the names and images of homes sent around the world before the industry collapsed. Donville's Royal Irish Distillery in the west of the city was Ulster's last big player. These are the chairs the board would have sat in on the day they closed the company. They were still in profit, but believing there was no future in Irish whiskey, they voted themselves out of existence. An indication of the despair that had overtaken a distilling industry that 30 years earlier had been the greatest in the world. Dunville's Royal Irish Distillery closed its doors for the last time in 1936.
Of all the northern companies, only Bush Mills survived, carrying their malt tradition into the present day. It's about walking in the footsteps of these legends that have gone before me that have um, left me this wonderful whisky. You always have the weight of, of tradition here, and I'm only a custodian. I'm only a small part of the history of Bushmills. 25 years old. Do you get emotional sniffing this after all that time looking back at it? the early days or the progression? You do, because this is a lifetime's work. Um, and I, I remember when it was distilled. I remember the laboratory analysis being carried out on the, on the raw materials. And I've watched these casks, picked them specifically for this purpose. And it's lovely to actually see them go out into the world and for people to enjoy them. Because that's what we do. We, we make whiskey that people can enjoy. There is a way that you don't want to be the blender that got it wrong. <laughs> it would be a terrible moment in history. Bushmills made it through the dark times that almost destroyed the industry in the early 20th century. This could have been the closing chapter in the Irish whiskey story. With just a few of the grand old names still in production, much of our whisky heritage was lost and almost forgotten. It has been a long road back, but a new generation of distillers, armed with a real sense of history, are putting Irish whisky on the world stage once again. It's hugely important for the current industry to know where they've come from. One of the things you learn is that history tends to repeat itself and it tends to go in cycles. And I'm delighted to say we're in a really good cycle at the moment for Irish whiskey. There's new entrants onto the scene, there's new distilleries. They're pushing the boundaries of what is Irish whiskey, what Irish whiskey can be. It's a very exciting time and it's wonderful to be part of it. There's a continuity in Scotch whiskey history, there's a continuity in American whiskey history, there's a continuity in Japanese whiskey history. The Irish whisky history, we all know that there's big gaps there from 1930s through to, to 1990s, so we've lost a lot of those traditions. And I believe that looking to the past and reviving the historic mice bills, reviving the historic techniques, looking to what the whisky heritage was in your area, in your county, in your parish, if you can bring that back to life and tell that story, I think we can find that knowledge again by going back and trying to rediscover what we were doing in those times. I think Ulster is certainly one of the melting pots of Irish whisky now. The amount of new distilleries that are appearing on the landscape is phenomenal. The enthusiasm for Irish whisky is stronger probably in Ulster than it would be in the rest of the country. And I'm part of this northern whisky revival. My PhD involves spending lots of time with dusty old files and books, and in the heart of the public records office, I struck gold, finding the original mash bill or grain recipe for Cumber, Ulster's last Irish pot still whiskey. So, Fanon, we've just started the massing process. Uh -huh. so Here in the Ards Peninsula, within spitting distance of Scotland, Ecklenville was the first distillery to be built in Ulster in over a century. Using my research, master distiller Graham Miller is recreating this classic whiskey, last distilled in 1954, just 20 miles up the road. Okay, for all, we're going to have a taste of the hearts now. So this will be a snapshot, an idea of what flavours we're going to get. For me, it's like even as a new make, it's quite well integrated. It has a little bit of spice there on the nose. Yeah. I expect when we taste it, we'll get a real hit. You can almost feel it going up your nostrils. Mmm! Oh my god! <laughs> They're incredible! Mm. That's spicy. Just that ginger mixed with uh -huh. milk fat mixed with cream mixed back with ginger. It's just fat whiskey. It's whole fat whiskey, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. None of this UHT whiskey. <laughs> I wonder what the folks from, from Cumber in the 50s would think of our, mm. our new make today. Incredibly proud, they'd say it was bang on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure of it. 
Good stuff. Even if it wasn't Cumber, but it is. <laughs> it will be. It will be. See you in seven years. <laughs> The next incarnation of Old Cumber will be well worth the wait. But another spirit from Ulster's past has already been reimagined for the 21st century. We picked an old brand, a brand that had been silent since 1936. We brought it back to life. We're doing it in a way that it does do justice. We made a promise to ourselves that we would put Dunfalls at the top table of World Whiskies. So I think now if I was to walk into the board of directors in Dunville in 1898, but I do believe in what we have done, we would hold our head high in that meeting. It's a very important to bring the history back into Belfast. It was a core industry in making lots of money, you know, for the city, for the country, um, and producing great whiskies. Belfast needs to get back to a position where it commands a sense of purpose again, that it can stand up and say, you know, proud at one point producing more whiskey in Belfast than actually the whole of Scotland at some points. People should be passionate about that. People should be passionate about what went on in Belfast. And I think that that can happen again. American sales were crucially important to Irish whiskey's commercial success in the late 19th and early 20th century. Its rediscovery by a new generation of American drinkers in the 1990s has made Irish whiskey the fastest selling spirit in the world. Once again, its fortunes are on the rise. It's like a deep breath before you go over the top on a roller coaster. I think we're just at the top of the roller coaster now and you know, come back in a few years time and we'll be going, woo, it's gonna be great fun. There's going to be a big party held on this site when Irish whiskey surpasses Scotch in the States which will happen in the next two or three years, definitely. I still think the best is yet to come. It's still early days. We have 34 distilleries. I think it's going to be five, ten years before we really see where that landscape is going to go to. Irish whiskey is, um, it's got such diversity across the board. We're all different scales and sizes. All these new players, we're all bringing something new to the market. And those traditional giants of whiskey, they're, they're basically paving the road for us. And Everybody's delighted to see the successes of other distilleries, no matter how big or how small. So I think the future is really bright and it's only getting started, it really is. Oh, whiskey, you're the devil, you're leading me astray. Oh, the 19th century was Irish whiskey's golden age. The 20th nearly finished it off. In the hands of the craft makers of the 21st century, Inspired by the legacy of the past, its future is indeed looking bright. So I've brought Mark a wee taste of new make old cumber to raise a glass of what's to come. So seven years to wait for a wee drop mare of old cumber. I mean, if it smells like this at birth, it'll be worth the wait. But it's strange to think the ghosts in these mirrors, they're not ghosts anymore, they're spirits again. It's a story we can all find ourselves in. Irish, Scottish, Scotch-Irish, Ulster-Scots. Here's to a spirit that belongs to us all.